All right, you crazy kids. Here's your intro to solutions lecture. First of all, what is a solution? A solution by definition is a homogeneous mixture. We've heard of that before, way back in unit one. Now we have another name for it. We call it a solution. There are different types. When you think about solutions, and salt water is a solution right here, that's one of the things we think about. We usually think about a solid dissolved in a liquid, and that's how you make a solution. But it doesn't necessarily have to be a solid and a liquid. It could be a gas and a gas, a gas and a liquid, a liquid and a gas, a solid and a solid, a liquid and a liquid. There are many different combinations out there. So don't you know have that definition set in your mind that you have to have a solid dissolved in a liquid to have a solution. For the components of a solution, we have a solute and a solvent. A solute, by definition, is what's being dissolved, and the solvent is the dissolving medium. For salt water, that would be like the NaCl going into the H2O. All right. Uh, easy way to remember this is the solute is usually the smaller thing, and it only has six letters, S-O-L-U-T-E, and the solvent is the bigger thing. It has seven letters, so the smaller word goes into the bigger word. So in this case, the NaCl would be your solute, and the H2O would be the solvent. That's how it works. Now, certain things dissolve and certain things don't dissolve. So why does salt dissolve in water but oil does not? The answer is intermolecular forces. And what we're really talking about there is like dissolves like. So you guys are gonna be able to predict whether or not something will dissolve in something else. And what you're doing is you're basically looking at the intermolecular forces of those two things. If they are similar intermolecular forces, then they dissolve. If they are not similar, then they don't dissolve. And what we're really talking about is polar versus nonpolar. So if I have something polar and I put it into something that's polar, well, that's like and like. Those are both the same. Chances are they will dissolve. Yay! However, if I have something that's polar and I put it into something that's nonpolar, well, those aren't the same, so it's not going to dissolve. Boo! And then finally, if I had something that's nonpolar and I put it into something that's nonpolar, that's like dissolves like, like, they're both the same thing, so it dissolves again. Yay! Okay, so that's besides the point. Let's take a look at actually what this looks like on the molecular level. So when I put salt into water, why does it dissolve? Why is it a like dissolves like thing? So NaCl, we should realize, is an ionic compound. Ionic compounds are super polar. They don't get any more polar. You have ions. You have Na pluses and Cl negatives. You have cations and anions. Very, very, very polar. H2O, we've seen many, many times. You know, I kind of draw it like this, like a dead frog. We know that its molecular shape is bent, um, it has a high difference in electronegativity, and therefore it creates a polar molecule. All right, so in reality, it kind of looks like this. In which this side is very negative, and the hydrogens are very positive. Now if we look at it, this has positives and negatives, this has positives and negatives, and that is a like dissolves like situation. Because they both are polar, or they both have positives and negatives, the solute is gonna be attracted to the solvent. If there's an attraction between the solute and solvent, then they dissolve. That is the like dissolves like thing that we talk about. It looks kinda weird. And what really happens here is the NaCl gets ripped apart. So I'm gonna have my sodium ions and my chlorine ions. And they're gonna be surrounded by water molecules. There's a video that I'm going to attach next to this video that really shows this action. You can view it if you want to. When they're surrounded by water molecules, the direction of the water molecules' little ears, or these eyeballs up here, right, is important for you to draw. And I'm spending some time on this, so chances are you'll have to do this. For the sodium ion, it's positive, so my eyes of my dead frog are going to point away. For chlorine, it's negative. My eyes are going to point towards it. That attraction between the solute and solvent is actually what creates the, well, the, creates the whole dissolving process, right? That's why it actually occurs. For the other question here, why doesn't oil dissolve in water, or, but oil doesn't dissolve in water? Well, you guys have seen oil and water before. They form two layers. Why is that? Well, you know water is polar. It's right here. That means just by common knowledge at this point in time, we should understand that oil is nonpolar. Right? Oil, if it's nonpolar, only has intermolecular force of lump dispersion. Water has hydrogen bonding. Those are not the same. Because they're not the same, they're not going to dissolve. There's not going to be an attraction between those two particles. So we have to have an attraction between the solute and the solvent in order for things to dissolve. So, all right, so right here, like dissolves like. So polar dissolves in polar, nonpolar dissolves in nonpolar. However, if you have one of each, nonpolar and polar, they do not dissolve. 
The exception to that is alcohols, which dissolve everything but ionic compounds. And you're gonna say, well, what's an alcohol? An alcohol is gonna be a hydrocarbon, kind of like this, with a hydroxide group off the end. So CH3OH, because it has that OH here, and this looks like a hydrocarbon, that's an alcohol. There are many, many, many alcohols out there. You're just gonna have to get good at actually identifying them. And the whole point is you have two pieces of the puzzle. You're gonna have what looks like a hydrocarbon and then a hydroxide group coming off of it. So I'm gonna have any long chain of carbons like this, and then I'm gonna have a hydroxide group coming off of it. So here is another example of an alcohol. And I believe this is butanol or propanol. I can't remember. Propanol is probably three, butanol is probably four. So I believe that's called butanol. All right. Now, how can we increase the rate of dissolution? And you're going to say, well, you haven't mentioned dissolution yet. Well, it's a fancy word for dissolving. So how can I rate, increase the rate in which my solute, my solvent, dissolve? The example I want you to think about here is like putting sugar in your coffee. All right, so what can you do to make that sugar dissolve faster in coffee? Well, there's four things. The first thing is you could stir it. If you're stirring it, you're gonna increase the rate in which the solute comes in contact with the solvent. You're basically freshening up that solute with new solvent over and over and over. That's why stirring it increases the rate of dissolution. Another thing you can do is increase the kinetic energy of it or increase the temperature of it. If you're increasing the temperature of it, they're moving faster. Well, once again, more solute-solvent interactions. Not too bad. Our third one, I can make sure I'm using uh, as much solvent per solute. So if I had two solutions, all right, and let's say this one had two grams of sugar already dissolved, and this one had four grams of sugar already dissolved, if I were to add more sugar into each one, which one would actually result into a situation where it would dissolve faster? Well, the one that has less sugar already dissolved is gonna dissolve a lot faster, all right? So if we think about it, you know, you're wanting to dissolve things, make sure you're using something that's not, doesn't have already a lot of stuff dissolved. If it doesn't have already a lot of stuff dissolved, it'll dissolve pretty quick. Our last one is the type of thing you're putting in there or the size of thing. And by the size of thing, I'm actually talking about surface area. Well, it's not how you spell surface. I wanna increase the surface area of whatever I'm dealing with. So if I'm dissolving sugar into coffee, if I use granulated sugar, it's gonna dissolve a lot faster than a block of sugar. And that's because granulated sugar has a lot more surface area, which is gonna result in more solute solvent interactions. So those are four ways we can increase the rate of dissolution. And now here, here, what's the deal? And the whole deal is to increase solute solvent interactions. So if you're able to do that, you will increase the rate of dissolution. Electrolytes are our next little piece of the puzzle here. What is an electrolyte? You've heard of it lots and lots of times. Oh, Gatorade has electrolytes. <laughs> Believe it or not, Gatorade is not an electrolyte, which is, I think, very funny, but that's besides the point. Now, what is an electrolyte by definition? It's something that conducts electricity. So if I were to try to, you know, to electrocute somebody in a bathtub of Gatorade, which is really morbid, I can't believe I just said that, but they would actually not be electrocuted because Gatorade does not conduct electricity, even though it's technically an electrolyte. So what is an electrolyte? An electrolyte is when you have ions in solution. Gatorade actually has so much sugar in it that the ions that are in there are masked by all the sugar that's in there. Sugar is not gonna break into ions because it's a covalent compound. Therefore, sugar water is a non-electrolyte, but salt water would be an electrolyte. Salt water has ions in solution. We have, we can see them right over here, right? Here's my sodium ion, my chlorine ion. Therefore, uh, salt water is an electrolyte. Sugar, however, is not gonna be an electrolyte because you would not have ions in solution. It's a covalent compound. Sucrose is something like C11H22O11. Okay, that's a covalent compound. There are no ions, so when I dissolve sugar into water, yeah, it dissolves, meaning it must be a polar compound, but it's not gonna be an electrolyte because it doesn't break into ions. So electrolytes, ions in solution. What are some examples of uh, electrolytes? Well, ionic compounds in solution. We can see them all here. See the little AQs? The little AQs tell you that it's dissolved. So all of these are breaking into ions. NaCl is gonna break into my sodium ions and my chlorine ions. Magnesium chloride would break into magnesium ions and two chloride ions. Potassium phosphate would break into three potassium ions and one phosphate ion. All right, so all those ions in solution are gonna result in conducting the electricity. 
Our next one is strong acids. There are seven strong acids. You simply have to memorize them. Here they are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Notice the little AQs. So all acids are aqueous, however, only strong acids conduct electricity. That's because they break into ions, all right? So when I put HCl in water, it's actually gonna break into a hydrogen ion and a chloride ion, meaning it's gonna be surrounded by water molecules. And those water molecules, when they're surrounded by ions, or vice versa, allow electricity or flow of electrons to occur. And that's what it's gonna look like. Pretty neat. So all of these strong acids, make flashcards, do whatever you gotta do, you gotta memorize those. Those break into ions, therefore they are electrolytes. Our next one is strong bases. Strong bases by definition are select group one and two metals bonded with a hydroxide. So an example would be LiOH, AQ. Here they are. Okay, it's got a nice little pattern for you. Um, those are the metals when they're bonded with a the hydroxide. They break into ions, therefore they are electrolytes. So if I were to draw this LiOH thing, I would have my Li plus, my OH negative, and once again I would surround these things with water molecules. Kind of like this. Oops. Pretty fancy. All right. Our last thing we're gonna talk about today are net ionic equations. So we just learned that ionic substances in aqueous form broke or break into ions. Strong acids and strong bases also break into ions. Now that we know that, we have to account for that fact when writing chemical reactions. So I'm gonna go through the process of writing an ionic equation for you. I have two examples here. Notice that there are two bullet points. Ions that show up on both sides of the reaction are canceled out. They're called spectator ions because they're simply watching what's happening. They're not part of the reaction. And this is a three-step process. So our first step in our three-step process is gonna be writing a full chemical reaction, something you've already done before. So here, my example number one, I have zinc reacts with copper two chloride. So I'm gonna start with ZnS plus copper two chloride, CuCl2. And then I'm gonna realize this is a single replacement reaction. Um, which one is more active, copper or zinc? Zinc is more active than copper, therefore it's able to replace the copper in this solution. So I'm gonna end up with ZnCl2. AQ plus CuS. Now, we see we have ionic compounds in solution. That means they break into ions. We're gonna show that on step two. So that's step one, writing my reaction. Step two is breaking everything that should break apart into ions. So I have my zinc, and that doesn't break into ions, it's just a metal. However, this is an ionic compound in solution, so that breaks into Cu2 plus AQ and two chloride ions, AQ. That's how that looks. On the other side, I have my zinc ions and two chloride ions, plus my copper. Copper's still hanging out there. Now, do you guys see any spectator ions? Do I have ions that are on both sides of my equation? Well, yeah, I got two chloride ions here and two chloride ions here. Because I have two chloride ions on both sides, I can cancel them out. They get removed from my equation. The question every year is, well, if I only have one on one side and two on the other side, well, you can cancel out one. One would remain on the side that had two. But now that I have two on both sides, both those cancel out, they're removed from the equation. Our third step is now rewriting it, removing my spectator ions. So what's actually happening here, I have solid zinc, reacting with some copper two ions, and that's resulting in some zinc ions plus some solid copper. That's what actually happens. The chloride ions do nothing. They, they don't change, there's nothing happening. But if we look at actually what does occur, looks like my zinc turns into an ion, and my copper that was an ion is no longer an ion. What we have here is a transfer of electrons. Right? This is a redox reaction. We're gonna get into that later in our talks about chemistry, but that's really what occurs. So electrons are moving from one component to a different component. Let's do one more example, and then you guys are gonna have some of these for homework. So sodium hydroxide reacts with copper two chloride. All right, let's use purple. So sodium hydroxide would be NaOH. AQ. I know it's AQ because this looks like a double replacement reaction. I have a compound plus a compound. Reacts with copper two chloride. So I'm going to do my CuCl2 AQ. So let's go ahead and predict our products. We're going to have NaCl AQ plus CuOH 
parentheses two AQ. Oh, wait, no, no, not an AQ. That's just come off now. If I look on my solubility chart, and that's insoluble, that's your solid, that's the precipitate that forms. Is it balanced? No, it does not look balanced. So it looks like I'm gonna have to put a two here and a two here. And that is my first step of my net ionic equation. Now we gotta think about what's gonna break apart. So here's an ionic compound. Here's another ionic compound. Oh boy, check this out. That is a base. That meets the requirements for a chat about bases right up here. Here's sodium and a hydroxide. Oh boy, why can't I write there? I don't know what happened. I don't know why it won't let me highlight that, but we're gonna keep on going. Now that is a strong base. So strong bases break apart into ions. That's really cool. So I'm gonna have Na plus, there's actually two of them because of the coefficient of two when I balanced, Aq, and I have two hydroxides, Aq. And then I'm gonna have Cu2 plus Aq plus two Cl negative, Aq. And that's that side of the reaction. My other side of the reaction, I have here sodium chloride, Aq. So that's gonna be Na, and there's two of them. Aq plus two Cl negative Aq. And then this is solid. And things that are solid don't, that doesn't meet the requirement to break apart into ions because it's solid, right? So I only ionic compounds in solution break up into ions, strong acids and strong bases. Everything else does not break into ions. So don't break things randomly into ions. Make sure they meet the requirements. The requirements for breaking into ions are right up here, right? So aqueous ionic compounds, strong acids, strong bases. Those break into ions, hence they're electrolytes. You have ions in solution. All right, so I'm going to keep this as CuOH parentheses 2 with a little s. Do we see any spectator ions? I have things on both sides of my equation. I have two chlorides, two chlorides. I have two sodium ions, two sodium ions. All right, and that's it. Now, you might say, like, oh, I have two hydroxides here and two hydroxides here. True, but they're different states of matter. One's an ion and one's part of a compound, so they do not cancel out, all right? They do not meet the requirements. I have to have the same ions on both sides of my equation. That's the first step. I'm sorry, that's the second step. We've already done the first step. And on my third step, I'm going to rewrite it as a net ionic equation, or an NIE. So here is my NIE. My net ionic equation, I remove my spectators. So I have two hydroxide ions, AQ, plus one copper ion, AQ. And it looks like these two ions come together to make a solid, OH2. That's the whole reaction. The sodium ions, we can see, aren't doing anything. Right? They're just hanging out. They don't change, nothing happens. Same thing with my chloride ions. They don't do anything. Because they don't do anything, I'm just going to remove them from my equation because they're not doing anything. In chemistry, I really care about the things that change. And here is your second example. All right, see you later.